Good evening. How are you? Isn't that great we get to get together and talk about ham radio stuff? Isn't that cool? I want to say thank you one more time to Mr. Randy. He's over here. He, he's the one that helps us get the spot. And uh, really appreciate that, Randy. Thank you so much. You don't have to, but you do that. And really appreciate it. I know the meeting means a lot to everybody here. So I'm going to go ahead and call, call the meeting to order. And uh, welcome to the Delta Club. Um, we try to do a lot of things that... Uh, that involve emergency communications, that involve uh, you know, learning new things. And we got a lot of folks here that have a lot of different talents and skills, and we're thankful to have all of you. Um, I think we were talking about this at a ham breakfast. You know, we got one guy up here, he does CW only, because that's his favorite thing. Um, some people will just only talk on repeaters ever. You got other people that are just on HF strictly. So there's a lot of different things to explore. I think one of those things is electronics. So we have a guest tonight that's gonna to talk about electronics. Before we dive into that, uh, I would like to remind you to fill out the survey. We do surveys because that's kind of our promise to you that we wanna keep doing stuff that you like. So if there's stuff that you don't like, if there's feedback that we need to get, by all means, please fill out that uh, feedback form. We've got the QR codes over there. Uh, you can scan that and, and do that. Um, we have tickets over here, so if you come in, please do the tickets and uh, get in for the raffle that happens towards the end of the year. All right, um, if anybody has membership stuff, Jim, could you raise your hand? Because I know a lot of people were looking. Yep, Jim's the treasurer. He's the guy to go talk to if you've got a form you want to join or you need to settle up, renew, whatever. Happy to take your money. So I do want to remind everybody, we do need to get out of here about 8.40, 8.45, so please be cognizant of that. Um, a quick little update on something, and I'll hand it off to John. Um, you know, we did some work on the repeater site over the weekend. We did tackle some pretty big issues, and uh, we're going to follow up with a more in-depth report on that but it just takes time to, to kind of get all that so I just want to let y'all know that's kind of a pending thing we will have a meeting and then we'll we'll share all that in but there's a whole bunch of stuff there to kind of go over so please be patient with us and we'll get that out there to you everybody's interested in what's going on but I really want to spend a second here just to thank um, the guys and those of you that have been former repeater trustees I know Bill's up here you've done that before a lot of you guys that have served in the past, Ned, a um, bunch of guys that have been here for a lot longer than I have, um, you know, any of these guys that have been doing this for quite a while, Barry's been involved in that too, obviously. So um, thanks for doing that work. I do want to also thank the current uh, guys that are doing a lot of this work, you know, Joe Camboli back here, um, Adam Honick, uh, Joe Duke. Mike Lumen, you know, all helping on that. And it's very much appreciated. It's it's a labor of love. I think we spent about a day and a half out there doing the stuff that had to be done. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an austere environment. It's not fun. <laughs> it's fun because you're doing ham radio, but it's, it's very difficult. Let's put it that way. Okay, John, let's talk about the program. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, when I first got my uh, uh, ham radio license, one of the first presentations that I saw when we were over at Ellendale was uh, by Glenn, uh, who did a uh, presentation on Arduino. And sadly, I've not done a lot with Arduino since. I do have one, uh, but I, I spoke with him, and he agreed to uh, said that it's uh, been a long time. And uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, present Glenn Papel. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. KW5GP. Thank you. It has been a while. It's been, what, about two, three years, thereabouts? Y'all are at least one program behind. This is the latest and greatest, but you missed one. Uh, the one I did at Dayton last year to a, if you've ever been to Dayton, I filled the forum room and they were turning people away because of fire marshal regulations. That's how much fun we were having in that one. This is a brand new one. Uh, there are slides in this that nobody else has seen yet. 
Um, this is a partial of Dayton because they told me I can only go an hour. We will be taking a break about halfway through because if you're like me, in 30 minutes is about all I can go. So, um, anyway, without any further ado, who am I? There are days I ask myself that same question. I am now newly retired as a network engineer and technology consultant from here in Memphis. My last job was over at MLGW in Bartlett. Uh, his first license of him in 1973. You know, back when we had to go to the FCC building and take these tests. And, uh, those were scary. I'm also the author of ARRL's Arduino for Ham Radio, uh, and now Elector Publishing, uh, Arduino for Radio Amateur Applications, uh, QST articles and product reviews. In fact, you'll see a QST article from me here in the very near future. And as you can see in the picture, I also show world champion Maine Coon cats. These are the monsters. Here's the scary part. This is a girl. The boys are bigger. And of course, everybody who knows me knows you have to go through this part. This is why it takes me so long to put a book together. I can't get to my enclosures. I can't get to my tools. And yeah, go ahead and reach for those snippers. <laughs> you will experience acupuncture. <laughs> but amazingly, they've never been burned or anything like that, but they are always underfoot. But there's a small problem. We have a new kid on the block. Uh, yeah, Sasquatch. He's only a three-year-old boy. He's got about two more years of growing to go. He's already mastered the art of <laughs> preventing any work from occurring. <laughs> so, so now I've got three to work around. But tonight, I'm going to answer that one big question that we've always had. And no, the answer is not 42. I've got a microcontroller, now what? Just like John was saying, now what do I do with this thing? Well, you can plug it in and watch the light blink. But uh, one of the most common questions I get asked is what to do after you get a microcontroller. Up until this point, my answer has been for you to think of a project and go do it. It's really that easy. And yes, it really is easy. But still, that's really not a fair answer for John and some of the others. Because, you know, I don't know. You know, what kind of project do you have in mind? I don't know. So, but it's okay. I cheated. Not a fair answer. But with Radio Shack gone, STEM, electricity, electronics gone, where are you going to get this stuff? There's nowhere to get it. Universities, they don't do it. They're into networking, HTML, web pages, all that cool stuff. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody doing electricity or electronics, really. Not until you get to the big universities like MIT and places like that. So where can you acquire the skills to build these projects? Even if we wanted to build, where do you find that? The hint, the answer is in ham radio. What parts and tools do you even need to get started with this stuff? Again, if we're new to electronics, how do we know? But first thing I'm going to tell you, don't be afraid. This is not the 3,000 volts in an amplifier two brig days. You're dealing with 5 volts, 3.3 volts. The odds of you hurting yourself are slim to none. Not totally empty, but slim to none. Uh, but it helps to learn basic electronics when you're going to play with microcontrollers. There are tutorials on websites such as SparkFun, Adafruit, others can help. And my number one thing, you'll hear me say this time and time again, the ARRL handbook. That thing is chock full of really cool stuff. And they update it every year. I don't say you have to get one every year, but I tend to update about every three to five years. Once you understand the various roles of the basic components, then you can learn how to combine them and build your own projects. And don't be afraid to wire something wrong. We have all done it. 
We have all seen smoke. It happens. Get over it. The nice thing is these components are typically very forgiving, particularly if the voltages and currents we're playing with. And even if the worst happens, they're cheap. So don't be afraid. If you blow up an Arduino Uno, you just cost yourself three bucks. All right? You can't even get Starbucks for three bucks anymore. Do without coffee for a day and go buy a new one. But I do say start out simple. Don't overwhelm yourself. Grow as you go. I, usually, I started out with an Arduino Uno at Nano and gradually progressed up as my projects got more and more complex. Get you some basic components. And, you know, a basic component assortment for the Arduino is actually very small, as we're going to see here in a little bit. But get you some basic components, and you've got almost everything you need to build just about any project you can think of. And another thing, I get mine from places like eBay, AliExpress, Banggood.com. I only buy from Adafruit and SparkFun if they have a particular chip or module that I can't get anywhere else. Parts is parts. It doesn't matter where you get them, they all pretty much come from the same place in China anyway. So save yourself some money. I've been getting the cheap parts from the, the Chinese places, and they are cheap, and I've had very little problem. I think I've had like two or three component failures in the 10, 11 years that I've been buying. So, you know, you have that from anybody. And with any hobby, you can spend a little or you can spend a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can have the flex or you can have the heat kit, take your pick. But you don't need the best of everything to get into microcontroller projects. In fact, you don't even need everything. You can get away with just a multimeter. That's it. You really don't need much else. And as your skills progress, if you're like me, you're going to want the big boy toys. So just like everything else, okay, I started out with the Baofeng. Then I had to get a Yesu. Then I had to get an ICOM satellite rig. And the list goes on and on and on. And you know, then, of course, you need a beam for that. Then you need a tower for that. So it, it's, it's what you want to put into it because you can also work the world with a little battery powered single board rig and a dipole. Whatever suits you. So you can do the same thing with your test uh, equipment. But in addition to a standard multimeter, there are some tools you're going to want to look at, drool over, put on your wish list. First thing, you're going to want a temperature controlled soldering iron. I laughed when somebody mentioned that I should get a temperature controlled soldering iron because I'd used a pencil all my life. That good old 25 watt weller, it's all I ever used. Well, I broke down and borrowed one from a friend one day and I immediately ordered mine the next day. It is just a, a, above and beyond with temperature control and get one that's got a heat gun. This way you can do heat shrink tubing and God forbid, if you're that good, you can do service mount too. I am not that good. But you can. And it's only about 50 bucks on AliExpress.com. That is my current favorite place, by the way, is AliExpress. Learn how to solder. First of all, learn how to hold the gun. That is not the right way. <laughs> If it smells like chicken and you're not in the kitchen, you have a fundamental problem. You will know about this real soon. In my case, I might smell cat fur, okay? But still. Uh, but, you know, but ask your fellow hams. This is a great club to do this with because you do have these nice programs. Have them do programs on how to solder. Basic kit building. You know, uh, what we did down at Olive Branch one year is we did a Saturday kit build. We all bought a little itty bitty $10 kit, soldered it up, got them all working. And it was just a little audio interface so we could run FTA. Little things like that. You can get these simple boards. Some ham fests, such as Dayton, have a forums, and they even have an area where they can teach you how to solder at Dayton. 
And my friend Joe Eisenberg does a kit building forum. And I believe he will also do them remotely, so you might talk to him if you would like to have that done. But learn how to build kits, start with kits if you want to learn how to solder, and go up from there. It, it, and you don't have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect starting out. You should have seen some of the mountains of solder I've done. <laughs> Something else you're going to want to start drooling. Now we're heading up to the flex. <laughs> when you don't, you know, you don't need an oscilloscope, but those of us that have used one swear by them. They are God's gift to electronics. Uh, and they do make troubleshooting easier once you do know how to use one. But they're not that expensive. Uh, Amazon has a two-channel storage digital scope. It's only 180 bucks. You can find these older, inexpensive sc uh, scopes at Hamfest flea markets. In fact, at the Russellville Hamfest uh, two weeks ago, last week, I can't even remember when I was in Russellville. On the second, what is today? Yeah, so roughly a week and a half ago, they gave an oscilloscope to Tom Medlin, W5KUB, and it worked. All he had to do was clean it up. So if you hunt around, you can find a scope if you want one or need one. Get your logic analyzer. When you start getting serious about your projects and doing some crazy stuff like I've been known to do, you're gonna want a logic analyzer, and you'll see why in a minute. But think of a logic analyzer as a digital oscilloscope strictly for digital signals. And this way you can see the timing relationship. So you know if something's not switching as it should, you can see this. Uh, a typical logical analyzer can show up to 16 channels of information, and it connects to a PC uh, via USB, and the price starts at 45 bucks. And this is what I'm talking about. You can actually see all of the timing relationships you need for a situation to occur, switching to occur. So you can say, huh, why is this light not coming on when I want to? Why is this relay not going? You can do the logic analyzer and actually track back. <coughs> the next thing, once you get beyond the basic points with a couple <coughs> wires, you're gonna want a development platform. The good news is you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can build your own, for years, I used a chunk of 12-inch uh, square plywood with some, a breadboard bolted down and an Arduino Uno, and I just patched wires across. I used that for years. Then I discovered this, the phase dock system. This is perfect if you want to move up to development. As you can see, this is actually from one of my books. This is the AR-40 rotator controller. I built a simulator on this, the, the phase dock workbench. And I call this a breadboard system on steroids because each of these little platforms can be snapped out and replaced so you can use building blocks. It's kind of like a little Lego system. So, oh, I don't want this display. I want an e-ink display. Snap it in, connect it up, off you go. And so you can customize this as you need. I reviewed this in the April 2020 issue of QST and it starts at about 67 bucks. And those of you going to Dayton, they will be at Dayton with their new stuff. Uh, the Dr. Tweedo, I am a very big fan of this. Uh, uh, the president of the company, Guido Benelli, uh, we've struck up a pretty good friendship over the years now. Uh, this is a great way to get started. I started by having to go to eBay and buy a, a starter kit with parts. 90% of the parts in that kit I've never used motors and just junk, never used it. So what he's done is he's put together these little boards. That's the Pioneer, that's the Explorer, and that's the Inventor. The Pioneer is an absolutely great place to get started because it gives you a, an Uno that you stack underneath the board, and then on the board, you've got LEDs, pots, push button switches, an ultrasonic module, all of this interface, so you can basically build some basic projects and learn the Arduino right on that one board without any additional wiring. So you want to play with it, get it out, put it on the table. When you're done, put it away. 
The Explorer is the next step up. It gives you a little breadboard area on it. And again, you can use a Nano or an Uno. It's got Bluetooth on it. It's got a soldering area if you want to do that. And it's got a lot of the same parts, but it's a little more powerful. And this was reviewed in the January 21, 2021 QST, and it's about 199. Now, the, the, the flex radio version of this is the inventor. This uses the new expressive ESP32. And don't let these numbers confuse you. We're going to go over those after our break. Um, and uh, the ESP32, it's great for creating more complex projects. It's got onboard Bluetooth. And so it's a much faster, more powerful uh, board. This was reviewed in the June 2023 QST, and it's uh, 297. That's the high end. You don't need to go high end. I do recommend getting the Pioneer if you're just starting out, because that's a one-stop shop. You can play, test, learn, put it away. The next thing, how many of us can read schematics? That's actually pretty good. Very few people can anymore, even in the industry. It's a lost art. But nearly all electronic projects are documented in the form of a drawing we call a schematic. It's nothing more than a symbolic representation of the components and connections that we need to create a project. SparkFun and Adafruit.com have great tutorials on learning how to use these and how to read them. This is all free stuff, by the way. I haven't made you spend a whole lot of money. That's when you have to buy my books. But a quick search will list a number of websites that can help you learn how to read schematics and understand these basic electronics. Again, the AWR handbook is another great place to learn. And again, parts is parts. They're all basically the same. Pretty much they come from the same place these days. We don't make this stuff in America anymore. It all comes from China. So save yourself some money. And yes, I do love Adafruit, and I do love SparkFun, and I love some of their stuff. DF Robot is becoming one of my very favorites. Uh, but they're expensive on some things. So save them for the stuff that you can't get anywhere else. So get your stuff from eBay, Amazon. My God, if I need it tomorrow, I will go to Amazon in a heartbeat and not care if I pay a couple extra bucks. Uh, AliExpress, Banggood. And many of these online suppliers will give you free or low cost shipping, Amazon Prime. So yes, it's not free, but it is. You'll want to get a stock of some basic parts uh, so you don't have to sit there with your thumbs and go, when is it going to get here? I need to build my project and I don't have that transistor. So get you some basic stock. The good news is with the Arduino, a basic stock is so general and versatile, you can use it for just about every project. There are only two transistors that I generally use in my projects, and you'll see in a minute. Uh, for those of you that are interested, on the table in the front of the room here, I have a handout of the parts I recommend that you get to start out with. So that's, that'll be a good kickoff and starting point. There's only a handful of resistors that I tend to use. I'm not going to read off the values to save us some time, but pretty generic. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different values. That covers 99% of the projects I've built. And unless I need it, I generally go with the eighth watt, go with the small stuff. Unless you're driving some power, you don't need anything more. Same thing with caps. One, two, three, four, five caps. Go with 25 volts or higher. The cool thing, am I in somebody's way here? The cool thing about the caps is get something, get a voltage that's low enough to get the job done, but above any voltage you expect to encounter in your circuits. If you're going to play with 5 or 12 volts, maybe even 24, get yourself a 25 or higher. And if you're going to play with 24, I'd recommend getting 30 and higher. But you know, leave yourself some leeway. But the, the key for a capacitor is that voltage level. Do not ever apply more voltage to a capacitor than it's rated, you will see smoke and you'll see other things. You may see stars when it hits you in the head. Diodes, again, small handful. I get one power rectifier type 
one in four double oh four. Small signals, the little one in forty one forty eight, that little itty bitty guy. A shot key, just because I like the low voltage drop on them. They're great for signal trans uh, signal diodes. And a zener, four point seven volts. Why? So I don't exceed five volts. Simple as that. Transistors, the 2N2222A and the 3904. About all you'll ever need, unless you're going to do some serious power. But I, I really have not had any need to go beyond those two. Voltage regulators, get yourself a handful. The Arduino only can do 800 milliamps on its little onboard 5 volt regulator. And you know, the ones with the 3.3 volt regulator, it's even lower. So get you some uh, standalone voltage regulators. You know, the, the four and the three there will cover you for just about anything you plan to do. Most of these microcontrollers are moving to 3.3 volts, so you're going to want to target yourself for 3.3 volt work. You're also going to want an assortment of LEDs, red, green, yellow, RGB, just whatever floats your boat as to what LEDs you like to work with. And they have these new addressable uh, LED strips. That's actually eight separate LEDs that you can power with a single data line and they're addressable. So you can set them in their RGB. And they come in 10 meter strips that you can cascade. I built a project for ARRL that's 30 feet long, 30 meters, it's 30 meters long. And an LED per inch, so lots of LEDs. It was nothing more than a field strength meter for data. <laughs> supposed to go floor to ceiling. Uh, other basic components, again, I only use three values of potentiometers. I do get different styles. I get the, the trim pots, the 10 turn pots, whatever. Again, whatever you anticipate your project's needing. And again, you don't have to buy all this stuff to start out. You know the kind of projects you're going to want to play with once you start getting into this, so you can start adapting your part stock to this. I have 700 parts at home, but that's because I get crazy. Wake up in the morning, I got, what do I want to build today? How crazy can I go? And believe me, you're going to see how crazy I can go. <laughs> because there's a special project that uh, AWRL asked me to do, and I was told nobody else had been able to do it. Challenge accepted. You tell me it can't be done and nobody else has been able to do it? Yes, sir, Mr. Minster. I will have it for you in a month. I had it for him in three weeks. Um, <laughs> you'll see that in QST here, by the way. But get you some SPST mini switches, uh, some 5 and 12 volt relays. Why 12 volts? Come on. Everything we play with is 12 volts. We want power rigs and cool stuff like this. So get some 12 volt relays. Get you some DC power jacks and plugs. You know, we go through those like candy. I don't know about you, but I order power poles by the you know, 50s and 100s and a whack. You know, about every other year, I have to buy another 100. I just got an order of 50 in this morning. And of course, rotary encoders. These are really handy to use. Instead of pots, you can use a rotary encoder, like as a VFO knob and things of that nature. The TFT displays. Uh, I really like the 1.8 inch and the 2.2 inch TFT displays. Most of these TFT displays are now on 3.3 volts, so you're going to want these level shifters. And these are bi-directional level shifters. Yes, you can use resistors to drop the voltage, but you're feeding 5 volts out of the Arduino into a 3 volt module. It'll work, but it's not happy about it. And so they don't blow, but they just don't like the voltage. So get you some level shifters. They're cheap. Uh, like I said, you can also use resistors, but since I've started using the level shifters, I've been real happy. I also like to use the organic LEDs. These are really bright, small displays. You can see them in broad daylight. So those are real happy. The Nokia 5110, I've kind of moved away from them, but they are extremely low power LCD visible in sunlight type of displays. They're very cheap. They're from the original Nokia cell phones. And they proved so popular that we get all the surplus. And for the time being, those of you that are familiar with the e-ink displays, I say, slow down, be really careful. 
It's a little known thing about them, but if you update the current technology, more often than every three minutes, you actually run the risk of physically damaging the display. It cannot tolerate changing that much. So strongly advise against using e-ink unless you have a very static application. Uh, the AD9850 module, this is great for RF applications. It will generate a clean, accurate sine wave from zero to 40 megahertz. Think of it as a VFO. And it's accurate to 0 0.0291 hertz. It doesn't drift. How accurate do you need to be? The SI5351 is very similar. It can generate frequencies from eight kilohertz all the way up to 150 megahertz. And it's got three outputs on that little board. But its output is a square wave. What happens when we feed a square wave into an audio, into a transmitter? Yeah, you got harmonics, you got distortion, you got it. So you're gonna need to filter and smooth that if you're gonna use it in those applications. You heard me say I love DF Robot. Here's why. They've got a speech synthesis module that is great for text-to-speech. You feed it the text, it speaks, and it's got like 16 different voices you can select. And it uses standard TTL serial or the I squared C interface. And we'll talk about those interfaces in a little bit. So if I'm speaking Greek, just look at me funny and pretend I didn't say it. They've got a voice recognition module. This one will support 121 built-in commands and allows you to add up to 17 custom commands of your own. And this is from their, on their website data sheet, including cat meows. <laughs> I don't know about you, but opposable thumbs on a cat is bad. <laughs> Giving a cat the capability to give it voice control, we are so screwed. <laughs> But you can use standard TTL or I squared C for this as well. So now think about this. And here's where I'm going to start throwing ideas into your head. You say, where do I get these ideas from? Just hang around me. I will throw them out at you and some of them will stick. How many of us want a voice control shack? <laughs> Tune me up five. Take me to 20 meters. No, I do not want to be on CW. Take me to upper sideband. Boom. Oh, I want to go to the FT8 calling frequencies. Boom. Oh, rotate my antenna 240 degrees. Switch to antenna number three. Bang. There's your voice controlled shack. Can be done with it or no. All right, we're going to go one step better, and thank God the cats can't do this. They've got a gesture sensor that can recognize 12 hand gestures. So, okay, turn my dial on the rig. Turn my antenna. It can sense this, and now you can do the gesture in case you don't want to talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the light come on over here. <laughs> and it still, it uses standard serial interface of the I squared C, very easy to interface. A lot of this stuff comes with li drivers, libraries, examples, so you don't need to know how to use it. Just cut and clip that chunk of code and put it into your program and off you go. So imagine the possibilities. You have the ability for it to talk to you, you can talk to it, and then you can give it gestures. Take me up five, take me down five. Split positive, split negative. You can do anything. You got 12 to choose from. You can stack them. Here's another cool module, and we're going to break here real soon. Uh, with many of the newer microcontrollers, they do have Bluetooth built in, but if you're going to play with the Uno and Nano, not necessarily. So you're going to want to have some of these HCO5 Bluetooth modules. Uh, for the ones that don't support Bluetooth, like the Arduino Nano and Uno. These modules can be used as either a Bluetooth master or a slave, but the technology is not what you're used to in terms of Bluetooth. The Bluetooth head headphones and everything we use, they use HID technology, which is human interface device. Okay, that is different from the serial protocols used by these Bluetooth modules. So, but, 
we're going to see something really insane with the Bluetooth module, that very Bluetooth module towards the end of this. And just another module or two here, the GPS module. Right? We all got a GPS out in our cars or on our phone, right? Well, we got these Pico balloons flying that have GPS so we know where they are. So they know where they are because there are certain places in the world you can't transmit from. So when they're overhead, they know it and they turn off their transmitter. GPS. Another cool thing about GPS, they are one of the most accurate sources for time that you can get. FT8. You're in the middle of nowhere. I need to know the time. I got a GPS to tell me. So most of these have an internal antenna, but some of them do have an external capability, just a little snap-in antenna. Here's a really cool one that I ran into. Uh, this is a wind sensor. There's one thing. All the wind sensors we're familiar with for wind speed, they do what? They have the spinning cups. Where are the cups on this guy? He ain't got them. He uses those two resistors. He measures the current that it takes to keep those resistors at a certain temperature and calculates the wind speed based on that current. It's accurate. This model is zero to 60 miles an hour. They have another one made strictly for Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma. <laughs> zero to 150 miles an hour, accurately. So now you know just how much it blew to take your house and tower down. So, but uh, whenever I order this stuff, I normally order two. Why? In case you let the smoke out. In case I let the smoke out, or I like it so much I use it and need another one real quick because my buddy wants one too. And uh, building supplies, and we're going to stop here real quick. Uh, Get you some basic building supplies. I like to use these 60 millimeter by 80 millimeter prototyping board as much as possible. Uh, they easily fit inside the enclosures you'll see in a bit. Um, and then for Arduino Uno projects, I like these proto shields because you can actually <coughs> slap those on top of the connectors on an Uno and swap them in and out. So those two will pretty much cover you. Get yourself some 30 gauge wire wrap wire. Comes in all colors. And there's your hookup wire for the underside of that. I've got the power and signal lines color coded, my grounds. So you can even color code your projects and keep track that way. And why don't we go ahead and take a, a brief eight, 10 minute break and we'll pick up from there. Thanks everybody, just take a little break. We'll be back in about uh, eight minutes. Make your way back to the seat, please. I have to prove that I've done this to a live audience. Well, we can all play dead. Yeah, at least I did it for an audience. <laughs> we'll let you interpret the rest. Okay. Make sure none of my publishers have told me they're canceling my contracts. Um, we will have a little bit of a question and answer period after, but I know you've got to get to your business meeting, so I've tried to trim this down just a little bit. So if I go too fast, kick me, throw me down, you know, throw stuff at me, slow me down, we'll be okay. But one thing, we are talking about making smoke, I like to put everything in sockets. And what I do is I get these header strips and they fit inside this board and you can create your own little sockets for the Arduino and the modules and everything. They all have that 2.54 millimeter spacing. And then I use old floppy disk cables and use these headers and pins to build my own little cables. So everything is interchangeable because, okay, I like to use a different display. Plug a connector, you know, make a connector for it, plug it in. I need to take it apart, it all comes apart, I can resolder it, it's easy to work with. Uh, so I use these, and you can cut them down to whatever size you want, they're cheap. Again, a dollar will get you 50 of these things. Uh, to mount the finished board, as you can see, I use an enclosure. These are the solar robotics enclosures I like. Those of you with laser printers can go to places like Thingiverse and everywhere else and get the, the templates to, to uh, laser cut your own. 
Uh, I use two millimeter hardware to mount things like the, the TFT displays and uh, 440s for the bigger stuff. And you can see it all fits inside this little case with switches and stuff on the side, the nano, the display, everything. This is that enclosure itself. I uh, get these from Solar Robotics. They have the safe and the mega safe. The only difference is the mega safe is made for the larger Arduino Mega, so you have more room for like a battery or something inside that case. Uh, but you can turn almost anything into an enclosure. They've got the Altoid Mint tins. You can fit an Uno in there. So they, they fit in almost anything you think about. I've seen them stuck in pie plates and just all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, and again, you can go to Thingiverse and other places to get the 3D designs. Uh, another nice thing, and this is something that we can all get from Hobby Lobby. I spend so much money and time in Hobby Lobby. <laughs> I'm, I'm going up and down the aisles and I'm not looking for anything. It's like, what can I do with this? <laughs> what evil things can I do with this? I have put a 40 meter CW transceiver inside a baseball trophy case. Right there. Put a JT65 transceiver inside. But they have these little water soluble decals that you can print on an inkjet or laser printer and you can do graphics as well. And the only difference is with the, uh, uh, the inkjet version is you have to spray a little uh, sealer on it before you wet it down. Let that dry. And then they just slide off like those decals we did in our models that we all built when we were kids. So, here we go. What to build. If you're just starting out, I highly recommend going to SparkFun, Adafruit, Instructables. They all have easy to build projects to learn from. Uh, you can always go and buy my books and build projects from there. I try to cover a lot of material in the beginning so that you learn about the parts you're going to use. I don't just throw you into the projects. I explain what you're going to be doing so that you can understand these parts as you're using them. There are several ways that you can communicate with the Arduino. You heard me say I2C or I squared C. This is inter-integrated <laughs> circuit. This is a industry standard. It's a two-wire standard, power ground and two data signals. And this is used by many microcontrollers to interface to those external modules like the displays, uh, a lightning detector, things of that nature. You also have the serial peripheral interface, and this is another industry standard uh, used by microcontrollers, modules, and external components. Between those two, Odds are you buy a module, you can find a library, which is the equivalent of a driver under the PC, to power and drive that little module. I did not need to know how to talk to the lightning detector module when I built that. I used a library. I said, tell me if there's a lightning strike. How strong was it? I didn't have to figure a thing out. It told me. So off I go. That's the cool thing about the Arduino. They have examples and libraries that you can cut and paste. This is all open source, remember? So you're free to, to steal from anything because you're not stealing. You've got the one wire bus. This actually uses a single wire plus ground to provide power and data. Uh, there's two versions of this, so be, be aware when you're playing with one wire. Dallas Semiconductor uses what they call parasitic power, and it actually steals power from the data line to, to power itself. The max detect ones require a separate power line, so technically they're three wall. But you also have a really new cool thing, and I'm gonna be playing a lot with this one, the controller area network. How many of you have played with a controller area network? Y'all raise your hands. You drove here with one. It's in your car. It's that little box that they plug in to give you your diagnostic information. They have an interface for the Arduino that you can plug right into that and grab your vehicle information. Think about it, speed, everything else. Tie that to a GPS and now you've got your grid square and an ETA to the next grid square. So you can use that. You've got the UART technology, which you've heard me talk about this TTL serial interface. Uh, 
That's the old school RS-232 type stuff. It's just TTL level, 5-0 and 5 volt level. So now, this was actually the breaking point I planned, so we're only a couple slides off. <laughs> Which microcontroller do I use? Yes. There are so many to choose from, you know, and there's more every day. So, as a general rule, I'm going to tell you, start out with the Uno and Nano. Don't overwhelm yourself, you can't go wrong. You'll be surprised how many things you can do with it. You're, you're about to see some crazy Uno stuff. Easy crazy. It's an 8-bit CPU, 16 megahertz. Slightly faster than your PC XT. Not much, you know, but you kick it into turbo, you're about even. 32K of flash memory. Uh-oh, your PC had more. 2K of RAM and 1K of electrically erasable EEPROM. It's got 14 digital I.O. pins, six analog input, all on that little itty bitty board. I should have brought one with me. It's powered by seven to 20 volts on that connector or via the onboard USB port. That's the Nano, it's the exact same thing as that, just a smaller format. That's about the size of two postage stamps. The STM32. This is some of the newer stuff. This uses the ARM Cortex M CPU. The Blue Pill version, which is one of the most popular, is 72 megahertz. It's got 64K of flash and 20K of RAM. How many of us are having flashback to the 70s when talking Absolutely. about these small amounts of memory? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the old Fairchild F8. All that little itty bitty, you only got this much memory, you shoehorn it in. Amazingly, we can shoehorn a lot in. But you've got 64K of flash, 20K of RAM, 32 digital I.O. pins, and 12 of those can do pulse width modulation. So you can dim LEDs and things like that. You've got 14 analog inputs, three of those serial UART ports, two SPI bus ports, two I squared C bus ports, and you have just spent $3. <laughs> Blow it up. I mean, I have a bin full of them. They all push the one forward when I need to do it, because they know what's about to happen. I, I'll go last. Then you have the ESP32 and the ESP8266. The ESP32 is nothing more than the upgrade to the 8266, so forget about the 8266. Runs a 32-bit CPU instead of the original 8-bit. Now you're at 160 to 240 megahertz. Uh-oh, we're up into the, the AT class. We're in the early 802, 86, 803, 86 days. Still 4 to 16 mega flash, 38 to 77 I.O. pins. How many I.O. pins do you need for your project? Yes. You're going to be hard pressed to use all 77. But still, you've got 18 12-bit analog to digital conversion pins. And you've got two 8-bit digital to analog. So now you can generate analog voltages, sine waves, things of that nature. You've got 10 capacitive touch switch sensors on this board. Four SPI ports, two I squared C ports, three serial UR ports, eight channels of infrared remote. So now you can sit in your, use your TV remote. 16 channels of pulse width modulation. It's got an onboard Hall effect sensor. And a Hall effect is nothing more than a sensor that can sense magnetism, or you've seen these open toothed wheels. As it spins, it can actually see whether there's a piece of metal there or an open hole. That's what a Hall effect sensor can do. We've just spent another three bucks. <laughs> oh, it also has onboard Bluetooth. The Arduino Nano 33 BLE, this is a new one. It's actually pin compatible with that original uh, 8 bit, 16 megahertz nano, except now it's 64 megahertz, 32 bits. One mega flash, 256K RAM. We can do a lot with that. 12, uh, eight 12 bit A to Ds. It actually has an inertial measurement unit built in. We're talking an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, Bluetooth, and Bluetooth BLE. And we're going to spend 26 bucks for this guy. But think about this. What can you do with a magnetometer, accelerometer, or gyroscope? Azimuth, elevation, rotation. 
So now I can measure. I can take this to a handheld antenna and track satellites and know where I'm pointing. You've got the ESP32, basically the same thing as the, the, the BLE, except it's 240 megahertz. Again, a lot of RAM and flash. It's got onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And it supports the Arduino, uh, C++, and MicroPython. Python is one of the new up-and-coming languages. They're calling it the basic of the modern era. Those of us that are from the 80s and played with basic, Python's every bit as easy. This board's gonna cost you 20 bucks. You've got the RP2040 Connect. You have not seen my Raspberry Pi Pico presentation. You're gonna have to have me back. Uh, this is how I get repeat visits. But I'm just here for the coffee, folks. But uh, you got a pin compatible for the Arduino Nano, so it's plug replacement, but it's not five volt tolerant, so you have to be sure and use 3.3 volts. It's a 133 megahertz dual core processor. 16 mega flash, 264K. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Bluetooth BLE. And it does Arduino and micro Python support. It's a $20 board. Did I? Yeah, I yeah, flipped back. back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I flipped back. This one has a built-in Bluetooth microphone and that inertial measurement unit. Supports Arduino Micro Python. It's got 22 digital and 8 analog, 30 bucks. This is brand new, the Uno R4. This is pin and plug compatible with the original Uno. So if you need a quick 48 megahertz upgrade to a 32 bit CPU, there it is. It, it also has an onboard ESP32, and I did it again. Wi Fi, Bluetooth, uh, 10 to 14 bit. A to D converters, all that cool stuff. He's got the CAN bus on board. It even has a little op amp on board that you can use. I don't know why they put an op amp on it, but we got an op amp we can play with. It's got an onboard real time clock. It's got separate hardware USB and the TTL serial ports. Again, Arduino and Micro Python. There are two versions the minimum for 20 and the Wi Fi, which naturally supports Wi Fi, at 27 bucks. These are drop-in replacements for the Uno. Here's my personal favorite, the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's a dual core, 133 megahertz horse, two mega flash, 256K of RAM, 26 IO pins, 16 of them will do pulse width, three 12 bit A to D, two SPI buses, two I squared C buses, all that cool stuff. It can do USB host capability. I keep doing that, don't I? It's got an accurate on-chip real-time clock and temperature sensor, four bucks. And oh, by the way, see this little boot select button over there? You can change the language that this thing runs. With, by holding that button, it will pull the language down from the PC that you want. It can run C, C++, Micro Python, Circuit Python, and two versions of BASIC, MM BASIC and Piccolo BASIC. All on this little $4 chip. So what language do I want to program in today? There you go. This is still my personal choice for high-end projects. So this is my, for four bucks, how can you go wrong? And yeah, it's from the Raspberry Pi, folks. How cool is that? But you can design your own projects. At some point, you're going to want to stop copying and build your own. This means you're going to want to document your work. How are you going to document it? Schematic diagrams. So here we circle all the way back around. The cool thing is there are some free schematic diagram programs that you can use. Up to this point, I have used the free version of Autodesk Eagle. That is transitioning up to the Autodesk Fusion product. And they're going to change up the free licensing on it. It's still going to be free for personal use, but it's got some limitations. I just said, you know what? It's time for me to go play with the big boys. I moved up to this product called KiCat or KiCat. It's open source. It's free. It's unlimited. It's powerful. It's supported. It's wonderful. Uh, matter of fact, my book from Elector is actually we used KiCat to create all of the drawings in it, and they. 
They literally took my drawings direct from what I sent them and straight into the book. No edits at all. But you don't want to spend the four bucks, three bucks, whatever it takes to get a new now? Fine. Go online. Arduino Simulator. Google that. It's an open source Arduino simulator written in JavaScript, runs directly in your web browser and simulates Arduino Uno. No hardware required. Supports the Nano Uno, Mega, Mega 2560, and the Nano. Wowkey, or Wacky is a browser-based simulator that supports the ESP32, the Arduino, and Raspberry Pi Pico. These are all online, so you can Google these and you can actually learn the Arduino without having to own one. So what's next? My current book, More Arduino for uh, Ham Radio, this is still available from ARRL. Uh, it includes another group of uh, completely new and unique ham radio projects. Unfortunately, they pulled my first two Arduino out of print. And I had a long talk with Dave Minster at uh, where did we have that talk? I think it was Dayton uh, two years ago when he had just come on board and we were talking and he's like, I can't believe we pulled your two books. And I said, he's, his words, how do we fix this? How do we make it right? And I said, I got an idea. How about I put together a best of the three book projects? So this book has the best projects from the first three book or from the three books and they've all been updated to modern display modern coding techniques modern everything so now you've got TFT displays instead of the Nokia displays you've got all the cooler stuff but it's the same older projects with with new code and updated we've also been in discussions about some future books uh, mainly focused on ham radio applications for the Internet of Things how many of you are familiar with the Internet of Things this is where you take a device and you hang it on the internet and you can actually control and sense things over the internet. So they want me to do an Internet of Things book for ham radio. They, they've got some wonderful, and I forget the term, I haven't played with IoT that much, but they have these libraries of devices that are made for ham radio that ARRL supports. They've got a huge library. I went to a seminar of theirs in Orlando last year. Uh, and of course the Raspberry Pi Pico. They had been after me for a Raspberry Pi Pico book for four years and I kept saying, no, I'm not gonna do it. I caved last year and said, okay. Uh, that was the previous presentation that y'all missed. But anyway, I do have an upcoming QST article about a wireless Bluetooth CW here. Let me reread that correctly. Wireless Bluetooth wireless CW keter. This has been in operation at W1AW for nearly a year. Nobody knew. Think about what this is. It's wireless. It's a CW keter using Bluetooth. There are no wires between the paddles and the rig. How do it do it? Magic. <laughs> Using those HCO5 modules I talked about. Yep, it's a wireless, Bluetooth, wireless CW here. This will be in QST very soon. I would not be surprised if it's in the April Fool's edition. It uses a pair of Arduino Nanos and the HCO5 modules to wireless remote a CW key or keyer and is capable of speeds up to 60 words a minute. Dave Minster has personally verified that it's 35 words a minute without stuttering. You can't go that fast. It plugs into the, um, the keyer plugs into the remote unit. It transmits the key contact information to this one, which is connected to the, the key input on the rig. And so as far as the rig is concerned, the paddles are direct connected. And you can't fool it. This has been on the flex at W1AW for nearly a year. So anybody who's visited has used it. And after their session, they're shown that there are no wires. And they did not know it. Nobody has noticed that that thing has been in operation. It's been that smooth. This was part of Dave's vision for the ham shack in the future. And that's what he wanted done and nobody had been able to, to do something. You can see how simple is it. A nano, 
the Bluetooth module, two relays, two transistors, that's the, the unit plugs in the flex. The remote, the keyer plugs in, the nano, the Bluetooth. That's all there is to it. It's that simple. The code took no time at all to write because I used somebody else's Morse code library. Done. Here's a sneak peek. You are the only ones that have ever seen this image. Um, you're going to have to leave that image when you leave. <laughs> if you can erase your minds, we have ways. Just look real close. Uh, but I recently finished Arduino for Radio Amateur Applications for Elector Publishing based in the Netherlands. This book will be available any day. It literally went to the print uh, a week ago Monday. So it should be available almost any day. Uh, it includes 10 new and updated Arduino projects for your ham check, including the Bluetooth wireless CW keyer. This is the front cover of that book. Here is the back cover. Here are the projects that are in this. You've got a CW peak and a Fox up keyer, a mini weather station using that wind speed sensor. Uh, DTMF tone encoder decoder. So now you can make your own touch tone encoders. Waveform generator, auto power on, that Bluetooth CW keyer, station power monitor, AC current monitor. And after that, it's time for me to enjoy my retirement. I have cranked out two books in a little over a year. Um, so, but this means I have more time for projects. I started on one this afternoon. And of course, there's gonna be more books. Elector has already said they want three. I don't know how this is gonna happen, but we're gonna try. And of course, that new kid on the block needs to go to some cat shows. He's adopted, by the way. He is a top show quality Maine Coon that uh, its previous owner just couldn't handle him. Um, not because of him, he's like a puppy, but because she's taking care of her mother with dementia and she was afraid that he would escape and be gone. So I have adopted him and he fit right in with the other two and he's like a puppy. He literally follows me all over the house. But for you, your journey is just beginning. You're builders, thinkers. The fact that you actually put up with me for an hour says an awful lot. Um, you're inventors. You're a perfect match for this microcontroller world. So go ahead and imagine all of the projects you can think of. I've thrown some ideas out. These are projects that I plan on fleshing out, but there's nothing that says you can't do it to knock yourself out. That's the cool thing about open source. Beat me to it. Not going to hurt my feelings one bit. So imagine the projects that you can build with these microcontrollers, and then go make them happen. As you've seen, it really is that easy. And maybe they'll let me come back next year. I've got an all new forum already planned. Typically, I debut my forums in Huntsville, but you've got to see a lot of things that Huntsville never saw. The working title of next year is Close Encounters of the Microcontroller Guide. <laughs> and I'm already thinking up some cool project ideas. Who says you can't hear a picture? How many of you are hearing those tones already? The Arduino plays music. I've got an MP3 player. So, with that, I'm done. Uh, questions, comments, thoughts, craziness? I've warned y'all out. Yes, sir? What is the difference between an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi? Are they just competitors? Yeah. The Raspberry Pi is a baby Linux computer, you know, about that big, and it runs Linux. So, it, yeah, it's more like a PC, but it runs the Linux operating system. The Arduino is what we call a microcontroller. It's down at the, the grassroots level, flipping bits and switches and relays and sensing things. Whereas, you know, think of it, think of the Pi as a PC, just shrunk really way down. Like your, like your car, it's all microcontrollers because it has to be instantly ready to work, right? A computer needs to boot up, and an operating system has to load, and then it can work. Okay. Yeah. So that's a massive difference. Yeah. It has a real-time OS. These things don't necessarily have a real-time OS. Some of them have box and stuff, but yeah. they're not really an OS. They actually are, are migrating to you are getting real-time OS, so that yeah. line is blurring very quickly. That's exciting. So, anything else?
Yes, sir. Have you ever had noise problems with HCO fives, like talking to your nanos? Did you have to do any extra magic to get the talk? Absolutely not. I've got you know hundred foot range without any noise issues whatsoever. It's just pure straight serial communication, simple and easy. The hardest part is pairing them up, and they do that almost automatically. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What's the distribution of Linux versus Arduino? Uh, none. Oh, well, uh, as far as the Arduino IDE, they work with most distributions. And if that's an issue, they've got a cloud based version of the IDE, so you can just browse to it and use it. And it will load you from the cloud. The development cloud for writing code. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Is there any hard work about any Any hard work? Hard work. Like hard stuff. Hard stuff? There is actually a heartbeat monitor that you can build and get. Difficult. Difficult. Oh, difficult. <laughs> there are some difficult things. Uh, for that, I leaned on others to provide me. Uh, the JT65, I did not write that. The guy who wrote JT65 HF wrote the guts of that. I wrote the surrounding pieces. So, no. There's a lot of easy stuff and a lot of cool stuff. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Who's won more Hamfest prizes, you or Joe Eisenberg? <laughs> <laughs> you left somebody out. You left Tom Medlin out. Yeah. Um, actually, in Orlando, Joe won five prizes in Orlando. I won two. So the answer, Joe Heisenberg, hands down. He, he and Tom Medlin go toe to toe. Tom actually won the uh, uh, Yesu FT891 over at Russellville last week. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, him and Tom typically go toe to toe. I can't hold a candle to either one of those guys. Anybody else? Okay, I'm done. Right. Thank you very much, y'all. I appreciate it.